Hello and welcome to the Valley and Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Frey, and today I will continue talking about the core principles of relationships, the first episode of which was number 16, where I talked about how all adult relationships are voluntary and how we must reassess our existing relationships on their own merit, where false notions of duty and guilt have been introduced into them. The previous podcast was not an easy one to record for me. There's a lot of anger, pain and grieving surrounding this subject, both in me and I was also aware of what emotions it might trigger in you, the listener. And in the previous podcast, I addressed the logical arguments behind the principle. But in that, I feel that I have missed an important focus on the emotional background of this principle. And that is what I want to rectify with today's podcast. Those of you familiar with IFS, which is Internal Family Systems, a mode of psychotherapy that personifies the various aspects of our personality, the various parts, sides or schemas, depending on your language. And it talks about there being managers or protectors, firefighters and exiles or wounded inner children. And there's a dynamic relationship between these parts where protectors emerge whenever our wounded inner children are about to be triggered, are about to re-experience a buried emotion that has been kept in the dark for long. And in the previous podcast, I, in my mind, in my imagination, talked to your protector and tried to convince him through logical argument and what I want to do in this podcast is talk to the exile the wounded inner child and address what he or she might be feeling so as I said there is a lot of anger and grieving when we discover how truly betrayed we were and I will say this in the beginning so that I don't have to repeat it at uh, every sentence this is not the case for everyone but it is common enough to be almost omnipresent. And even for those of you who had a very good childhood, this might help you understand others. And when I say betrayed, I am talking about what has been addressed in the previous podcast, particularly how familial and societal propaganda was used to prop up and maintain emotionally parasitic relationships, how parents who are supposed to take care of all the needs of their children and are morally bound to it by the act of having become parents, flip that completely around and use their children to fulfill their own needs and convince them that that is their duty for the rest of their life. And there are two phases of this discovery. The first one is the phase of anger. Healthy anger gives us the energy to protect ourselves in the present, to confront people who've done wrong to us in the past, and if they don't repent, to disengage from them in the future. And the phase of grieving that often follows, but perhaps even more commonly is intertwined with the phase of anger in the process of healing. Grieving is the re-experiencing of the emotion that has been suppressed. It is bringing it out of the dark. It is processing it in a safer space than the space where it occurred. It is much easier to re-experience painful emotions where we are in an otherwise safe and self-sufficient environment as opposed to it being inflicted upon us as children where our abusers are also our main and only source of getting all of our needs met. And if it is not processed, if the grieving is not done in a safe space, both meaning that we're self-sufficient adults and also a safe space in the moment, in solitude or in therapy, where we can maintain an adult presence in the moment, 
if it is not done there, the grieving will come out as anger at the worst times and it will be projected onto others. You can often see very inappropriate answers to situations by people where it's inexplicable why they are reacting so vigorously, why they're so angry or why they are so hurt by something. And it doesn't make sense given the magnitude of what has just happened. Well, that is anger or pain coming out not in a safe space in the wrong moment. And the less healing is done, the more likely this is to occur repeatedly and systematically. Psychologists talk about how parents have children to fulfill their own unmet childhood needs since they've never grown up and developed a self-sustained system of self-esteem, a um, way of being contained and getting their own needs met by themselves. They seek permanent attention and affection and unconditional love and unconditional trust, appreciation without the context of their character and actions. And all of these things are inappropriate in adult relationships. All of these things are properly in childhood and are a developmental aspect of childhood that is supposed to be outgrown at a certain point. But when these needs are not met, they are carried over into adulthood where they can fundamentally never be met externally in the same way. And people can get an illusion of this kind of unconditional love in early phases of relationships, especially romantic relationships. That is what makes them so intoxicating. But that facade will keep on cracking. And when that happens, often couples decide to have children. It is a gruesome reversal and it is a complete betrayal of the child's needs that they are created to support the immature adult's emotional needs rather than being nurtured in their own needs. And children in these situations can never grow up to adulthood unless healing occurs later, and they don't, usually don't gain the independence and the self-esteem associated with an adult, and thus the cycle perpetuates when they try to get these needs met. And this is a very painful thing to consider even in theory, but once we apply it to our personal situation, then it becomes a hellish experience. All children have an understanding of what is going on. They understand that their needs will not be met in the appropriate way, but that is such a painful realization and they're so dependent on their parents that that is not an emotion that can be lived with as a child. It's too dangerous and there isn't any kind of internal support system developed at that point to be able to process it. And hence the protectors arise. And the most gruesome thing is that this emotional vampirism is often continued into the child's adult life. And, and some parents will work whatever button is the most effective, be it pity, be it guilt, be it duty. And they're fully supported by all sorts of propaganda in the educational system and in the movies and basically everywhere around us. I can't say that I don't feel compassion to them because it must be a horrifying situation when you're cut off from something that you so desperately crave. It is an addiction to their children and parents as they age and if they don't heal they'll be able to get less and less of the attention and affection from the outside world. You can gain an illusion of that through having beauty or having a lot of energy or having a successful career or a lot of romantic partners but as people age all of those become more difficult to achieve or maintain and thus their children can be the only source and parting from that must be horrifying on a metaphysical level. Think of how old people will die when their partner dies 
they will die shortly after. That is the level of need that we're talking about here. It's often stronger between parents and children. And they also stay in their adult children's lives so they can forever keep the truth from them. They can deny or make jokes about the abuse. Probably have or at least have heard all of these quote-unquote funny family stories where if you look at them with a more skeptical eye, with a more compassionate eye, you will see that they're just abuse stories. And again, it's hard to not feel an empathy for this. There's a chasm where these parents' integrity and self-esteem is supposed to be, and they're basically hanging on by a thread on the illusion that their abuse didn't matter in the end, because look, we're still connected. But despite the fact that compassion and empathy can be felt for this situation, it is still horribly wrong and a horribly evil thing to do. It is fundamentally a perpetuation of the abuse into the adulthood of their children. They no longer have the power to actually inflict more direct abuse or neglect, but they can cover up the past and keep their children from healing. And there's theoretically a way out in these situations. If they admit and if they do their very best to make amends and if they commit wholeheartedly to growth and healing of their own selves, there's a possibility of continuing the relationship. That, however, takes immense resources. It's hard enough for the victim to, to embrace what has happened because of the pain it causes. Well, it is significantly harder for the abuser, and the more abusive they have been, the more abuse they have dealt, the more likely that they were abused themselves, and the less likely it is that they can build some kind of support system that will get them through navigating this inner hell. Now, there are arguments that some people are immune from conscience, and that they actually and truly enjoy inflicting abuse, and uh, right neurons light up when you observe it. I personally believe that this is, this is the pinnacle of abuse. It's not a special kind of person, but this is the result of a complete severance from reality. And I have serious doubts that these people can genuinely and fundamentally be happy what they have done. I see growth and healing as the only way of achieving full human potential, and you could call that experience happiness. Well, if they can't understand that they were abusive, they are barred from this growth, and one might argue that as such they are barred from happiness. I believe that in the big picture, this is not that important for the victims of abuse. Ultimately, healing doesn't come from knowing that our abusers are suffering. It might be a soothing influence, but it's not the end goal or a main tool of that. So whether there are true sociopaths or not is not that important in the end. This was a little digression and getting back to the main line of thought. As I said, if parents do all these things, they make the amends, they commit to growth, or if they were not abusive to begin with, a relationship is possible between adult children and parents, but it must work like any other adult relationship, and the parental child role must be shed completely. It is meant to be a relationship of equals, like all other healthy adult relationship. It cannot be based on pity from any side, or guilt, or a sense of duty, but on what all other healthy adult-to-adult -adult relationships are based upon, a commonality of values, a love born out of the mutual respect for shared virtues, and a level of equivalency and development, being at a relatively similar level of growth. And this alone can be a very significant block to healthy and functional relationships between parents and their adult children. The children of abusive parents who rediscover and bring up the abuse will almost always be ahead in their growth, 
the moment that the parent might first be confronted or the information may be brought to them and it can be a trigger for their own growth, the adult child has had to have done significant amounts of preparation work that was not reflected to the outside world or to the parent. And here I assume, together with the author, highly recommended author, Daniel Mackler, that people who are not already committed to growth very seriously and have done work in that direction will stop growing completely when they enter relationships and especially will stop growing when they have children. So the extra age doesn't bring advantages with it. It actually brings disadvantages because, in general, younger people are just less set in their ways. It could be simply a question of habits. Having built a habit of not thinking, of not being conscious, of ignoring and distancing oneself from reality for decades can be much harder to overcome. And adult children also can go faster because they have less guilt to work through. They might have been abusive in their own relationships, but that's usually between peers, where moral responsibility is not as strong as it is from parent to child. And the morality of the question is important, and I've set it out in the previous podcast. Parents are fully responsible while children owe nothing because of who chose to create the relationship, who entered the relationship and who didn't enter the relationship voluntarily. But I believe it is only a part of the ultimate question when assessing whether to maintain a relationship with parents. And as I said, I think the fundamental question is instead, if I strip away the false guilt, the false and indoctrinated sense of duty, were this any other person, would this relationship bring value to me? Is this person aligned with my moral views, with my outlook on life, and with my values? Is this person on a similar level of development in their virtues and mental health? Can I trust this person, and can this person trust me? Will a relationship between us lead to our mutual enrichment and growth? Though what I observe is almost always a no, I genuinely and sincerely believe that an answer can be a yes, but this will take immense amounts of work and dedication, and 95% of that work is to come from the parent and not the child. I personally cut contact with my family. I did it because part of them wouldn't even admit to the abuse and just tried to layer on new levels when confronted with it, and others because they wouldn't fully commit to growth. And given the damage that has been done in the past, it would take an immense effort that I felt they weren't really committed to making and a very long time to get a relationship going and it would be a relationship that would probably be not very fulfilling because I would always be ahead in my healing. And this might sound very cold to you, but it was an immensely painful decision to make. And here's the thing, is staying out of pity in a relationship not the most humiliating thing that you can do to another human being. I think such relationships are mutually degrading for both parties, both to live as an object of self-sacrifice, going with the Randian definition, to surrender something of greater value for the sake of a lesser one or a non-value, or to live knowing that you can only earn someone's attention and affection through their self-immolation. It is a fundamentally mentally sick place to be in, and something that only a truly broken person could desire. It is my belief that through leaving and making it known why I did, I've not only done the best for myself, but I have given the template for the only possible way to their own healing and growth and I genuinely wish them the best in this journey. To sum up, as an adult child, your contact with your parent becomes voluntary. To make it a healthy one, guilt and duty must be overcome, and the relationship must be judged on its own merits. There's no other way to having anything close to a healthy connection. 
this in many ways is the template for all other adult relationships and thus is the most important one to address. Having an unhealthy relationship with our parents will make having healthy relationship with other adults very difficult and might keep compassionate people and people who are dedicated to growth away. Thank you for listening to the Valiant Growth Podcast and if you have a close friend who could benefit from this knowledge, I ask you to share this material with him or her. And in the spirit of podcast number nine entitled The Challenge of Giving Quality Support, I urge you to consider the nature and depth of the relationship and being gentle before doing that. It's one thing to put this out into the public because that way everybody has an out. Everyone can say, oh, this doesn't apply to me. But when you share this personally with someone, that option is no longer there.